Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks a lot for joining. Um, firstly, apologies that uh, it didn't happen on Monday. There was obviously a global outage of Facebook and the likes, um, which is why uh, we've had to reschedule. Thanks a lot for being flexible and, and, and coming today. Uh, for those of you who unfortunately aren't able to join us today, we will be posting it on YouTube and you can watch it uh, play back then. So today we'll be talking about diverticular disease and benign anorectal pathology. But firstly, welcome to this course. It's designed by junior doctors and it's aimed for junior trainees, uh, not just medical students, not just uh, trainee doctors, but also the wider MDT who might want to find out a bit more about the pathologies that they're helping to care for on a daily basis as well. Um, it's not got any nonsense, it's just the core information which you need for the job and also to pass any exams. You're welcome to post any comments or questions in the Facebook Live. I've got it running um, on my right. Bear in mind there's a one minute lag between you asking and, and me seeing it. And any questions that you want to ask, you can also email it afterwards and we'll ask for some feedback at the end. So the general format uh, of any of these sessions will be uh, a bit of anatomy, a bit of pathology. We'll speak about various disease presentations, uh, speak about the investigation management, a few complications, um, of management and of the disease processes. And then we will uh, do some cases at the end to consolidate what we've learned so far. So a bit about myself, my name's Mark. Uh, I'm an academic FY2 doctor, graduated last April during the COVID pandemic. Uh, work currently at University College London and my interests are primarily in ENT, maybe orthopedics, I'm still considering both. I like research and I also like some teaching. So the key learning points for today's session is going to be understanding the spectrum of diverticular disease. It's an umbrella term and it comprises a few different things, but we're going to split the, the, the talk into two parts. So that'll be the first part. The second part will be understanding the core benign anorectal pathologies, which is a very broad topic, but I've chosen to cover the four commonest things that you'll come across um, when you're on take, working as a surgical doctor, but also the things that come up in the exams the most. We'll be understanding the key concept for investigation and also management, and then apply these skills to some MCUQ cases at the end. So let's go straight into part one. So diverticular disease. Let's start with a bit of basic anatomy, because I know people will be joining with all sorts of different backgrounds and, and prior knowledge, but we'll cover the basics in this slide. Uh, so the large intestine starts at the ileocecal valve, where the small intestine plums in uh, just, prox just distal to the cecum. Uh, the appendix is at the end of that, and it then goes up the ascending colon, turns 90 degrees to the uh, left, anatomical left at the right uh, hepatic flexure, and then turns again 90 degrees at the splenic flexure, goes down the descending colon, sigmoid colon, and then ends at the rectum. You can see there are tinea coli, which are three longitudinal muscle bands. On that diagram on the left, you can just see one of them, but they're longitudinal muscle, and what they do is contract the tube. Uh, on itself, which is why you get these outpouchings, which we call haustra. And that makes it anatomically different to the small bowel, which doesn't have these haustra, and also makes it identifiable on a plain film radiograph when you can see these haustra. In terms of arterial supply, remember the large intestine is made up of midgut and hindgut. So up until two thirds of the way of the transverse colon will be midgut, and then beyond that will be hindgut. And the arterial supply um, mirrors that. So you've got the SMA, the superior, sorry, the uh, yeah, the superior mesenteric artery, which supplies all of the ascending colon and two thirds of the transverse colon. The middle colic artery anastomoses with the uh, left colic artery at that area, um, and the descending and rectum uh, made up are comprised by the inferior mesenteric artery. Good. So diverticular disease, a few definitions to start. Um, diverticulosis, they, diverticulum, diverticular disease, diverticulitis, they all sound the same, but they're actually very different. And people will use them specifically to mean different things. So we'll go through a few of those now. Diverticulosis is herniation of the mucosa and submucosa through the muscularis propria. And if you look in the top right there, you can remind yourself of the layers of the bowel wall. And the muscle layers aren't a tube, they're actually, they're actually in, a, in, a, in a mesh like that, which leaves these little pockets in between where if you get kind of a weakness in the, in the inner layer, it can poke out of this mesh and form these little bubbles, uh, which we call 
A, a single one would be a diverticulum, and the general condition is diverticulosis. Diverticular disease is an umbrella term which refers to any clinical state caused by symptoms pertaining to colonic diverticular. So whether you have inflammation of the diverticular, whether you have just a diverticular there in the background, it's all encompassed within diverticular disease. If you have complications, diverticulitis, which we'll go through in a bit, like uh, uh, abscess formation or perforation, it's still all comprised within diverticular disease, which is the kind of the main umbrella term. So a bit of epidemiology, 10% of people under the age of 40 have diverticular disease. Doesn't mean they suffer bouts of diverticulitis, but it means they have at least a few diverticular, i.e. a few outpouchings. The incidence goes up with age, 50% of people over the age of 50. So it's extremely common. By the time we all die, we will all have at least a few diverticular. Doesn't mean we will have suffered from bouts of diverticulitis, as we explained in the terminology a few minutes ago. The um, incidence is the same men and women. So there's no kind of particular one or the other. And it mostly affects the sigmoid colon. Interestingly, it doesn't, it very rarely affects the rectum. And the reason for that is that the layers of muscle, um, so you know those, those teeny that we talked about, actually, when it gets to the rectum, forms a continuous sheet around it. So remember before I said they were kind of a crisscross, by the time they reach the rectum, all that muscle forms a continuous sheet. So there's actually kind of nowhere for them to poke out to. So rectal diverticulosis is extremely uncommon. Asian ethnicities have a high incidence of right side disease, which can mimic appendicitis, but the typical kind of exam and typical UK presentation will be a uh, left iliac fossa pain. So a few risk factors, low fiber diet, because you're constantly straining, um, because you're constipated, which puts more pressure on the bowel wall and therefore forces that uh, mucosa through that cross hatching of muscle, therefore making the outpouchings more likely to occur. Aid, we've already discussed that. Decreased physical activity, obesity, smoking, alcohol, not surprising, they're bad for everything. Um, NSAIDs and also genetics. So things that affect your connective tissue very logically um, means that your kind of cross hatching and your mucosa is less structurally sound and therefore it's more likely for it to, to pouch out. So let's speak briefly now about the spectrum of diverticular disease because it is a spectrum and it's all encompassed within diverticular disease. So diverticulosis, remember we mentioned that earlier, um, is just the presence of diverticular. And that's asymptomatic. It's just outpouchings of the bowel. It's not doing anything. It's just there. Diverticulitis, the suffix itis, meaning inflammation of, is inflammation of the diverticular. So that's when you've had diverticulosis. And for some reason, one of these outpouchings or many of them become inflamed. That typically presents with left lower quadrant pain, sometimes right, as we've explained. Can change in bowel habit, sometimes constipation, sometimes diarrhea. Fever, because you have an inflammatory response to that. Uh, lower GI bleed, so fresh red blood coming through the back passage, is a very common presentation, which can be by itself or alongside all of those other features. And sometimes an abdominal mass too, if there's a, an abscess or a phlegmon, which we will explain in a short while. So that's uncomplicated. Complicated diverticulitis is if you have peritonitis, i.e. if the bowel wall has perforated, and there's either air, fluid, or frank poo has just come through the bowel wall and is in your peritoneum, and therefore you get inflammation of the peritoneum, peritonitis. And that presents, as I'm sure you probably all know by now, uh, with guarding, so you simply it's too excruciating to touch the abdomen, um, rigidity, so that the, the muscles are rigid tight to try and protect it, and shock, so you know hypotension and tachycardia, features of sepsis. Complicated diverticulitis can also be when you have diverticulitis with any of the complications, which we will talk about later, but those will present usually with symptoms of fistulas. The fistula is an abnormal connection between two epithelial surfaces. So if you have a connection between your bowel and your bladder, you'll have poo in your urine, you might have gas uh, coming out your urethra, uh, you might have recurrent UTIs, you can also have an abnormal connection between your bowel and your vagina, and you'll get all those things coming out of your vagina, or you can have it from your bowel to your skin and you have skin discharge. So it depends where the abnormal connection is. The Hinchy classification is used to speak about the different severities. It's, it's used to, to stage 
uh, a bout of diverticulitis, so an inflammation of. Hinchy stage one is just when you have that diverticulum gets filled with pus because it's infected and inflamed. And when you have a walled off area of pus, that's called an abscess. So you might have a localized, so it's just in one little area, pericolic because it's next to the bowel because the diverticulum is separate from the bowel, uh, abscess, collection of pus. If that becomes very big, because that can swell, can swell, can swell, it might not pop yet, but it will swell and swell. And it's large, that will be a hinchy stage two. And it's in the mesentery, i.e. the bit that's uh, you know connecting the bowel to the uh, posterior abdominal wall, which has all the vessels and the fat and things. So one and two are uncomplicated. That's kind of an abscess. You can recover with antibiotics and you'll be fine. Three and four, when things start to get a little bit messier. So Hinchy stage three is when you have perforation. So one of these inflamed diverticular pops and you get gas coming out into the peritoneum. So that's when you might see air under the diaphragm or uh, air around the bowel wall. That's bad, but not as bad as Hinchy stage four when you have frank feces because the pop, the you know the, the the rupture is so big in the bowel that feces is coming out, and that has a whole you know there's a whole range of badness. It will you'll present um, septic, you'll have extreme uh, guarding, and when you do your emergency operation, um, there's a higher chance of postoperative infections because it's obviously not sterile. So some common complications: abscess, which we um, talked about already and uh, you get a kind of you know a um, collection of pus uh, alongside on 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 the of the bowel you get uh, bleeding so you can have if one of these diverticular and inflammation of it erodes into a small vessel that will just bleed and you'll get large volume um, pr uh, bleeding you can have perforation as we've explained sepsis which we've explained as well uh, and an obstruction so if you've had a previous bout of inflammation and you get scar tissue which forms where there was severe inflammation that scar tissue won't expand like the rest of the bowel and so you can get moments or, or you know episodes where you go into large bowel obstruction and so you'll present with you know absolute constipation and it will back up you'll get vomiting and you'll feel unwell a phlegmon funny word it's basically an abscess which isn't formally walled off so if you have a large it, it, it's an inflammatory mass of tissue uh, which might be a dematis, might have pus, but it's not walled off in the same way that an abscess is. That's what a phlegmon is. So before we go any further, um, I'd like to offer you guys a chance for a bit of interactivity. Um, I'd like you to tell me the differentials uh, for left lower quadrant abdominal pain. Uh, I won't wait here until all your answers. We'll come back to this. But if you guys for now uh, write down the... Um, I'll write down the link for ev dot. If you can see it, then great. But I'll write it in the chat as well. Oh, you can see it. Great. So if you go to that link and start typing in differentials for left lower quadrant abdominal pain, we'll go through them at the end. Uh, so some investigations, uh, bedside bloods, radiology. Every time you speak about an investigation or think about an investigation, think about it in those three things. When you're clerking them, what can you do at the bedside there and then? Bloods, what do I need to send off, which you know I can go through in an hour or two once I finish writing them up? And what investigations can I get in terms of scans? So at the bedside, everyone's going to get an ECG when they come into A&E. Um, it's not specific to diverticular disease. But if you think you know they've just had a perforation, they might need a laparotomy and a, and a surgery, you're going to want to know what their heart's doing to see if they can handle it. Anyone coming with a fever, you're going to get them a rapid COVID swab. Uh, and anyone going to theatre because of the aerosol generating procedures associated with intubation, etc., you're going to need to know their COVID status. Uh, urine dip, urine pregnancy test. Again, urine pregnancy test, you're going to be putting them through a scanner. Uh, you're going to, which will have high dose radiation. So you need to know whether there is a uh, no pregnancy there. In fact, CT scanners will not accept women of childbearing age through their scanner unless there's a negative pregnancy test. And a PR examination. If you don't put your finger in it, you'll put your foot in it. Bloods. Uh, so you want full blood count, use knees, LFT, all the normal ones, basically. And you want to know what their electrolytes are doing. Group and save and clotting, more to do with operation. So if you think you might be operating on them or if they're losing a lot of blood, you're going to need to do a group and save 
plus or minus a cross match if you're going to transfuse them there and then. Radiology. So the easiest one to get would be an erect chest X-ray and an abdominal X-ray. The erect chest X-ray is important that it's erect chest X-ray. So that means they've been sitting up or standing up um, for a minute or so. And the reason you do that is because that allows, if there has been any perforation and therefore gas leakage from the bowel into the abdominal cavity, it allows time for it to rise up because it's less dense than whatever it's sitting in. Um, and therefore you can see it under the diagram. And that top right image there has a little arrow where this, so this is normal. The other side is a gastric bubble that is allowed, but on this side, you're not meant to have air there. You, on an abdominal x-ray, you can also see uh, this. If anyone knows what this is, um, type it in the chat now. I'll give you a few seconds whilst I speak about CTAP. So CT abdomen and pelvis uh, with contrast is indicated if you suspect diverticulitis and there is unknown raised inflammatory markers. So that's quite a low threshold for doing a CTAP if they're in the hospital with it. And that's because you need to know whether there are any of these complications. How big is the abscess? Have they got a perforation? Do I need to operate? Those are all answers that you can answer with a CT abdomen with contrast. Don't forget, if you're giving them contrast, you need to know their renal function, because if they have renal failure, then you can't give them contrast because you'll get a contrast induced nephropathy. CT angiogram, so gram image of angio, the vessels, and CT, the method that you're looking at. So you're looking at the vessels with CT. So that is useful if you have a diverticular bleed. So some patients will present the most common cause of fresh, massive GI hemorrhage in someone you know, over 60 uh, will be a diverticular bleed. And I explained why that happened earlier on. CT angiogram will pick that up. You'll see the bleeding point because you'll see contrast, which you've infused into the vein, spurt out at the point uh, where there's the bleeding. You'll only see that if there's about one mil per minute of bleeding, which is actually quite a lot. Um, so you, the, the need, there needs to be, it needs to be kind of hosing out to that extent. If you can see it, then you might speak to interventional radiology and they could maybe embolize it or put a coil in and stop the bleeding at the source. So going back to, um, so we've got one person saying coffee bean sign. Um, so the coffee bean sign is for a volvulus. So that's when you have large bowel obstruction. That's when the whole sigmoid twists on itself. Um, I agree this looks a bit twisted on itself, but the coffee bean sign basically takes up the whole abdomen where I haven't, you haven't, you haven't seen the whole x-ray, but that's only right in the corner. So forget about the coil. Coil is sort of normal in that sense, but what it's actually showing is Riegler's sign. And that's a sign just like air under the diaphragm on the top image. It's a sign that there's air on both sides of the bowel wall. We all know that air is meant to be on the inside. That's fine. But air on the outside is bad. If you compare the right image to the left image, do you notice how the right image looks kind of 3D? And that's because you can see both sides of the bowel wall because there's gas on both sides. You only see a difference when there's a difference in density. So compared on the left image, you have gas and then you have bowel wall, which is a different density. Therefore, you see a dip change in color. But then you have bowel wall and, you know, just like vacuum slash fluid in the peritoneum. And that's not got a different density, which is why you don't see a second color change. Compare that to the image on the right, you have gas in the bowel, then the wall, then gas on the outside again. So that's why you see two, that's why it looks kind of 3D because you see both sides of the bowel wall, regular sign, a sign of air in the peritoneum and therefore perforation. So the pillars of management, just like if you ever speak about investigations, it's bedside, bloods and imaging. When you speak about management, it's conservative, medical, surgical. So conservative management for, now we're speaking about diverticulitis and complications of that because there's no management for diverticulosis because as we've mentioned, it's uh, symptom free. Well done, someone else got regular sign. Um, so nausea and vomiting, treat that, give them ondansetron, give them cyclozine. Um, pain, uh, treat them with you know, the, 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 ladder of, the ladder of analgesia, start with paracetamol, then go for a weak opioid, then a strong opioid. Buscapan can be quite helpful, aka hyacin uh, butyl bromide, um, which is an antispasmodic. And when you have kind of colicky pain, um, that's quite helpful. Lifestyle advice. So if someone comes in with a flare of diverticulitis, when you're sending them home because they're better, you can offer them some lifestyle advice to prevent future flares. Increase the amount of fiber that you eat. Remember, we said that constipation is, uh, you know, causes this uh, flares and worsening of diverticular disease. So increase the amount of fiber they eat. Exercise, you know, be better to yourself. Exercise, less smoking, less alcohol, etc. 
Ispagula husk, sorry if I said that wrong, it is impossible to say, um, is a bulk forming laxative. It's essentially fiber. You pour, you mix it in a drink and it is fiber. If you can't eat enough fiber, have some Ispagula husk and that will give you enough fiber to prevent the um, progression of disease. So no antibiotics. There's the only time you wouldn't give antibiotics. If they're systemically well and they have mild pain, they're not immunosuppressed and they don't have significant comorbidities. Basically, if they are well, the pain's not that bad. You think it's probably anti uh, diverticulitis, but you haven't really confirmed it because the pain is not that bad. You might be seeing them in a GP surgery, not in A&E. Then you don't have to give them antibiotics because we're wary of antibiotic resistance. Diverticular bleeds are often managed conservatively. So unless, as I mentioned before, they are hosing uh, and they need uh, a CC angiogram and uh, a a coil potentially an, emboli an, emb an embolism of the bleed, then most diverticular bleeds settle with conservative management. If you think about it, I mean, what else are you going to do? You're either going to coil it or you're going to wait or you're going to take out their whole bowel. So if their bleeding isn't bad enough to do any of those things, then you manage it conservatively. Keep an eye on them, make sure their blood pressure is you know, at a good level, uh, you know, around 120 and uh, go from there. So medical antibiotics is the mainstay of treatment for most bouts of diverticulitis. If it's uncomplicated, you can get away with oral antibiotics. In my trust, it's comoxiclar for five days. Complicated diverticulitis, you give IV antibiotics. Remember the difference between uncomplicated and complicated. We talked about it a few slides ago. Basically, Hinchy 3 or 4 or any of the adverse features. Sepsis. Do your sepsis six, that doesn't change no matter what pathology you uh, are doing. Uh, and early ITU input, as always. Thromboprophylaxis, so preventing uh, clots, then you want to give prophylactic low molecular weight heparin. If they're overweight, over 100 kilos, you give that twice a day instead of once a day. So in my trust, it's enoxaparin, 40 milligrams, over 100 kilos, you give it twice a day. Same with tinsaparin. If you think they might have surgery, don't give them uh, thromboprophylaxis. It can wait. That you know your consultant is going to be and your patient is going to be angry at you if they can't have their surgery in twelve hours because you've given them low molecular weight heparin versus the tiny risk of them having a PE in those twelve hours. So if you're not sure, ask someone, hold it. But if you are sure that they're not going for surgery and they're in hospital, i.e. they're Hinchy one or two, it's uncomplicated diverticulitis. You're giving them antibiotics, then they need low molecular weight heparin because they're going to be immobile and they're going to be with an infection and therefore at a higher risk of developing uh, a DVT or APE. Interventional radiology, we've already mentioned their, um, their role in coiling of large diverticular bleeds, but they can also drain big abscesses. So those big pericolic abscesses, the hinchy twos, which are in the mesentery, if they're more than three centimeters, then you want to cut it out. I said cut it out, I mean drain it out with a needle under ultrasound. So surgical, Let's, we're finally at the surgical bit. If they have previous episode of complicated disease and they've recovered, but they have ongoing symptoms, i.e. they have a fistula or they have a stricture, then they can have an elective surgery. I'll come back to that. Most times when you're thinking about surgery in someone with an acute flare of diverticulitis in, in hospital, it's because they perforated. So they have air of the diaphragm, they have a regular sign, or most likely you found that out with a CT abdomen pelvis and the radiologist will tell you that there's a perforation. The operation you do for a perforated uh, colon is a Hartman's procedure. And this is something that you all have, like, have to know what it is. So a Hartman's procedure, you, get, you, you do it if there's fecal peritonitis, large perforation, or kind of an unsurvivable bit of bowel, if, there, if it's ischemic, for example. So what is a Hartman's procedure? There's a little image of it near the top of your screen, but it's when you cut out the sigmoid and then make a stoma with the proximal bit and stitch the other bit. So this sigmoidectomy and a proximal end colostomy. But that means in you know, more simple English, you're cutting out the bit that's inflamed and horrible. And now you've got two ends. One of them is making poo, one of them's not. Bring the one that make poo out to the surface of the abdomen. And that's an end colostomy because you've got the end of the bowel is as one lumen up onto the top. A loop colostomy would be if you brought out both sides and cut a little strip in it and you'd have the proximal and the distal bit together. 
but that's not what you're doing here. Good. So most patients have a single episode of uncomplicated diverticulitis and they'll just receive medical management. And by that we've discussed just means um, antibiotics. One third will unfortunately have a recurrence in five years and they're at a higher risk of abscess formation. Uh, and there's often the patients who present at a younger age will have more recurrence. And recurrent disease has a higher mortality because you're more likely to have perforations or strictures or things like that. Only one in four surgery patients that have a surgery remain symptom free. Follow up. So if you have come into hospital and you've had an acute flare of diverticulitis, surgeons will often ask the juniors, i.e. us, to book them into a clinic appointment in six to eight weeks, something like that. So it's a non-urgent referral to whoever's treating them in hospital, their clinic. And the reason they do that is because usually they want a colonoscopy. And, it's, and, and the reason they want the colonoscopy is to make sure that there are no um, cancers in the bowel as well. And it's not because diverticulitis causes cancer or that the other way around, cancer causes diverticulitis. It's more that if you have diverticulitis, you are usually meeting the two-week weight criteria for having a colonoscopy for cancer. You're usually having a change in bowel habit. You're usually over whatever age it is, 65, and you're usually having some, some bleeding through the back passage. So that's why you get the colonoscopy. So let's do some questions about diverticulitis. Um, a 56-year-old man presents with his first attack of diverticulitis. Which of these complications is least likely to ensue? So we've got to our kind of mini cases and uh, questions like that. So I'll give you a few seconds to think about it. So the least likely to ensue is malignant transformation. For a malignant transformation to occur, you need chronic inflammation, multiple bouts of inflammation, which will eventually change the DNA in the cells and eventually cause you know, tumor suppressor genes to be um, mutated, et cetera, in order for you to get a cancer. All those other things, if you're unlucky, can happen with a single bout of diverticulitis. Get a really bad div uh, bout of diverticulitis and it forms a scar, you get a stricture get a really bad bout um, and it can form a fistula between you know, your bowel and your bladder. You can get an abscess and a phlegmon just with Hinchy um, one or two. So that's kind of almost part of the attack of diverticulitis. Question two, which of the following sites is the development of diverticulosis least likely? And I've talked about this already in fairly specifically, so I won't give you too long to answer this one. The answer is rectum, and that's because the muscle, once it gets to the rectum, forms a continuous sheet, a tube-like sheet around it, whereas uh, previously you have those tenia, which are strips, and you have the cross-hatching of the muscularis propria. Question three. A 75-year-old man is admitted with large bowel obstruction and on investigation is found to have significant sigmoid diverticular stricture as the underlying cause. What is the most appropriate treatment? So this is one of those complications of diverticulitis, which is a stricture and therefore large bowel obstruction. The answer is laparotomy and Hartman's procedure. So laparotomy means a cut, um, which often goes from the zipper sternum down to the pubic symphysis and a Hartman's procedure. And we've already explained what that is. The reason it's not any of the others is because if you have bowel obstruction, that bowel is edematous, it's angry, and it's not going to do well if you do any of those other things. If you dilate it, you'll probably perforate it. Um, if you put a self-expanding metallic stent, you're not actually fixing the problem and all that bowel is so edematous, you'll probably get a recurrence of the obstruction anyway. Uh, loop ileostomy isn't appropriate because you'll have, um, you know, you're, you're cutting in, it, it's the wrong part of the codon, you know, you're bringing out, um, the, the ileum, which is way proximal, and you're not fixing the problem. And a colorectal anastomosis would be if you're putting the two ends back together. The reason you don't do that is again, because the bowel is angry and edematous and healing is really impaired if you're in that state. What you want is a Hartman's procedure, bring it all out, make sure everything's separate. You can then wait and six months later, you can reverse the Hartman's procedure and then do the anastomosis. So patients who have Hartman's procedure aren't you know, bound to having stomas for the rest of their life. 
during COVID, it's been, uh, you know, the, the surgeons have been struggling to do those reversals. So people are stuck with it for a bit longer than normal. Last question is, what's the most appropriate investigation for diverticulitis? And we've kind of gone through that, so I won't go through this very quickly. Great, so they've all come up on my screen above. I hope they have for you as well. Um, constipation, ureteric, pregnancy, left ectopic, cysts, torsion, ovarian, ulcerative colitis, impaction stone, cancer, rupture, pyelonephritis, UC colitis, PID. These are all great. Which ones have we not got? Ischemic colitis. That's one that has not been mentioned. So that's when you have ischemia, maybe by an embolism. If you have AF, you throw off a clot and you uh, infarct part of your bowel, that will present with left. You can also have another differential would be epiploic appendagitis, um, which I don't know if we mentioned it. Let me all go back to the uh, anatomy quickly. There you go. This top one, can you see how there are mental appendices? It's, it's specific to the large bowel, but you have these little kind of fat tags which come off the large bowel and those can become inflamed and mimic diverticulitis as well. And in the live specimen, they look like this. So you can see these little, these little tags, that's called epiploic appendagitis because it's an appendage, inflammation of the appendage. Cool, what else haven't you mentioned? That's most of it, well done everyone. So part two, well done for staying awake for part one. Um, part two now completely separate, close that chapter of your, of your mind uh, and open up this next one, benign anal rectal disease, absolutely thrilling topic. Um, and we're gonna talk about hemorrhoids, fissures, fistulas and abscesses, which is also part of uh, fistulas, but we'll explain that in a bit. So again, some basic anatomy first. There's a little summary slide. So the first thing to mention is about anatomical position and some terminology. So if you're ever describing the anus in your notes to your colleagues, whatever, you have to describe things in a clock. But that clock is based off the patient being in the lithotomy position. So on in their back with their legs spread. 12 o'clock is up, six o'clock down, three o'clock right, nine o'clock left. But remember when you're examining patients, they're usually in their left lateral position, which means you have to kind of imagine them on their back and then change it, change it back. Because obviously if you're looking at them in the examination position, you might think 12 o'clock is towards their right glute, but it's not, it's still as if they're in the lithotomy position. So that's important to mention first. Secondly, we can talk briefly about the anal canal. Um, it's surrounded by two types of sphincter, the internal sphincter and the external sphincter. And they both play a crucial role in the maintenance of fecal continence. The internal anal sphincter surrounds the upper two thirds of the anal canal, and it's formed by the involuntary circular smooth muscle in the bowel wall. So it's involuntary and it's supplied by hypogastric plexus. The external anal sphincter is a voluntary muscle. So it's skeletal muscle and it surrounds the lower two thirds of the anal canal. So it overlaps a little bit with the internal anal sphincter. It blends superiorly with the puerectalis muscle of the pelvic floor, but we won't go into the pelvic floor in detail, but if that rings a bell, then great. The superior aspect of the anal canal above the pectinate line or the dentate line, um, which marks the difference between the superior and the inferior part of the anal canal, the superior bit has the same epithelial lining as the rectum, which is the same as basically the whole gut, which is columnar epithelium. So basically everywhere between the, uh, well, the lower part of the esophagus to the um, to the, to the dentate line, the pectinate line, is columnar epithelium. Inferior to the pectinate line, the inner canal is lined by non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. So basically the same as skin, but it's not keratinized, which means it doesn't have as much keratin in it. And this is quite an interesting area of the body because it is where the endoderm meets the ectoderm. There's no kind of mesoderm intermediate where there, which there normally is. So yeah, above pectinate line is derived from the embryonic hindgut and below is derived from the ectoderm. Good. 
there's a little summary table there if you want to look at the you know because because above and below have a different arterial venous nerve and lymphatic supply but i've left it there for your uh, perusal later on so hemorrhoids straight into our first pathology sorry about the picture at the bottom so what is it a hemorrhoid is a swollen vein in the lower rectum this might come as a surprise but hemorrhoids themselves are normal they are vascular cushions and without them we'd all be incontinent so you need them we'd be incontinent to like kind of liquid and, and gas you need internal hemorrhoids in order to maintain continence so look on this image on the image right hand side that is just the vascular cushion which if you imagine it's normal on the other side when everything's collapsed forms like an airtight liquid tight seal so without them we'd be incontinent but hemorrhoidal disease, which is what this slide maybe should be called, is when you have a problem with the hemorrhoids. So they might become engorged, too big, and they might start to prolapse out of the body. They might become thrombosed, i.e. a clot in them, and that causes pain. Ex true external hemorrhoids, i.e. hemorrhoids from the perineal vessels outside, you know, below the pectinate line, are actually extremely rare. So when you hear someone saying external hemorrhoid, ask yourself, do they mean external hemorrhoid or have they not listened to this talk or read their books? And do they actually mean a prolapsed internal hemorrhoid, which is much more common? So that picture at the bottom is a prolapsed internal hemorrhoid. And those vascular cushions, which we meant, I know, I know the diagram above only has two, but in actual fact, we have three at the three, seven and 11 o'clock position. Uh, remember that, you know, the, the, the clock position that we talked about earlier. And that forms a bit like, you know, the valves in the heart, and a, a liquid and airtight seal. So how does it present? It presents usually with painless PR bleeding. So painless blood coming from the back passage, usually kind of either splattered in the bowl or patients will say that they need to sit on wiping. So they might notice some blood on the tissue paper. It can also cause itching. And I put pain if from those in brackets because it's slightly rarer. But if they, for example, someone with a history of hemorrhoidal disease comes in with acute pain, that's exquisitely tender to touch, and you have a look and you see a hemorrhoid, then you think it's probably thrombosed. Risk factors, heavy lifting, prolonged sitting, obesity, constipation, pregnancy, anything which increases your intra-abdominal pressure and you know, increases you know, constipation because you're forcing it out, pregnancy because you've got a baby pushing down, heavy lifting because you're straining um, and being fat. Anything that increases your intra-abdominal pressure will make you a higher chance of developing hemorrhoidal disease, not having hemorrhoids because we all have them. So diagnosis, pretty simple, you have a look. Um, that can diagnose prolapsed internal hemorrhoids or external hemorrhoids, but can be quite difficult to diagnose fully internal hemorrhoids that haven't yet prolapsed because they're not severe enough because they're typically impalpable. Imagine touching a soft, squishy vein inside the body. You can't really feel it. There's nothing, there's nothing to feel. Um, so you often need to do proctoscopy, which is a small, like a mini colonoscopy. It's kind of like a speculum that you might use in, in a female examination, but you put it in and it's got a light and you can see the hemorrhoids then on the clear surface of the proctoscope. So treatment for hemorrhoids, conservative treatment, a sitz bath. That's a basically sitting in warm, kind of salty water and that soothes the itching uh, and helps them kind of retract back in dietary fiber remember we said constipation is a risk factor and will make them worse so increasing your dietary fiber will help and hydration for the same reason because it softens up your stools medical the same sort of uh, topic you want stool softeners um, in order to you know decrease the the how, how firm the stool is and therefore decrease the straining that's needed in order to have a poo. Anusol is basically a topical uh, anesthetic and a soothing agent, which you put on the hemorrhoids themselves, um, which can relieve that, the, you know, those itching symptoms or uh, sometimes the, kind of the low key bleeding symptoms as well. If they're thrombosed, i.e. the blood that's in them has clotted off and it becomes extremely painful, you can use topical GTN, uh, glycerol trinitrate. Surgical management of hemorrhoids, you can cut them out, um, not surprisingly, and that's the main way of doing it. So 
this surgical procedure and you'll go in, cut them out and stitch up what you've cut out. You can also do band ligation, which is when you basically put an, an elastic band around it and squeeze it really tight and it either kind of stays there and shrivels up or it, the band's so tight that it just falls off. Or sclerotherapy, which you might use for esophageal varices as well, where you inject some sort of chemical which just like coagulates the blood and basically clots it all off. A thrombectomy is when you have a thrombus, i.e. A, um, you know, a thrombosed hemorrhoid and there's a blood clot in there. What you can do is make a small little incision, a couple of millimeters within the hemorrhoid, and then use some tweezers and pull out the clot. And that will often uh, relieve the symptoms because then you'll get blood flow again. Cool. That is hemorrhoids in a nutshell. Let's move on to the next uh, most common anorectal disease, benign anorectal disease, which is um, anal fissures, aka fissure in anal. Um, what is it? It's a mucocutaneous, i.e. mucosa and skin, remember that pectinate line, defect of the anal canal, basically a tear. Very painful, as you can imagine, and so it presents with painful PR bleeding. So why is it painful? Remember, below that pectinate line is innervated, is, is basically skin. We've said it's non keratinized squamous epithelium, it's part of the ectoderm, and therefore the innervation, if you go back to that table, um, is uh, somatic, you know, it's part of the dermatin, it's S3 or 4, whatever, um, and you, you feel it, that's why it's painful. If you had a tear higher up in the rectum, it wouldn't feel exquisitely painful in the same way. So if it's above the pectinate line, you don't feel in the same way. You might feel pressure, you might feel pushing, but let's say you have a perforation in your rectum, you don't feel the tear of your rectum, you feel the peritonitis, you feel the pain that's caused by inflammation of the peritoneum, not the tear in the bowel itself. So that's why it's painful. So risk factors, mostly idiopathic, but as you can imagine, constipation, uh, just a mechanical thing. If you're pushing out a massive poo, then it will tear sometimes. Also Crohn's and tuberculosis, systemic problems, which uh, are, you know causes inflammation everywhere. TB is surprising, I admit, but it's true. So how do you diagnose it? Again, PR examination. Now, often a telltale sign of someone who has an anal fissure will be that they refuse to be examined. So, you know, they might let you have a look, but as soon as you even like spread one of their cheeks, you can't even, you can't even do that because it's too exquisitely painful. Because imagine you're just, as soon as you do that, you're kind of opening the fissure. And every time they're opening their bowels, they're opening the fissure. That's why it's extremely painful. And actually it's quite hard to heal. Like if you've ever cut your finger on, you know, on a joint or something, then it's the same sort of concept. Conservative management. Oh, sorry, I haven't mentioned EUA. So EUA is a, an examination under anesthesia. So if these people can't tolerate an examination normally, then sometimes in order to diagnose it and treat them properly, you give them an anesthetic. Just a very, very quick one, half an hour or so, and it wouldn't be a full intubation. You'd probably use a laryngeal mask, just a quick day case thing. Uh, and examine them properly. And sometimes if you see something, you might do some of the surgical things at the same time. Quite interestingly, the um, fissures 90% of the time happen in the posterior midline, i.e. the six o'clock position. Uh, I don't know why, but that's true. Management, conservative, stool softness, fiber hydration, same as the other things. That should make sense to you by now if, you're, um, if it's painful to... Um, you know, if you're passing a large poo and it's stretching it all out, then make sure it's softer and make it easier to happen. Medical topical GTN. GTN is a vasodilator and also a relaxant. So instead of, you know, the, the, the muscle being really spasmed and cramped, it will just relax a little bit. Uh, Diltizem, same mechanism. Botulinum toxin, i.e. Botox, not used for wrinkles, but again, used to relax the muscle and allow healing. Surgical. So this is the kind of the meat of it. So lateral sphincterostomy or advancement flaps. I'll explain one at a time. Lateral sphincterostomy, otomy cut in, sphincter, sphincter, lateral, the side. Cut the sphincter at the side. Um, what that does is kind of opens that and it means that you've got kind of a, a, kind of a, 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 a bigger um, a bigger wound, so to speak, um, which instead of it being small and just tearing and healing and tearing and healing, it's kind of a bit flatter and more open and allows it to heal almost by secondary intention. Um, as you can imagine, if you're 
messing around with the sphincter, there is a chance of causing incontinence. So 10% of people who have a lateral sphincter ostomy, which is the best treatment for, you know, uh, fishes that haven't responded to conservative or medical treatment. 10% of them will develop incontinence deflatus. Advancement flap, very complicated, plastic surgery sort of thing, where they're um, like flapping some of the skin over and passing it on. We don't need to know much about it. But, but a flap is when you move a whole chunk of skin, sometimes muscle, across somewhere. For example, you might move this part of your skin onto the nose if you have a cancer to reconstruct. That's what a flap is. It's a plastic surgery thing. So fistulas, onto our kind of final topic. Um, what is a fistula? It's an abnormal connection between two epithelial surfaces. I mentioned that earlier. So for anal fistulas, that will be between the rectum and the skin. So you imagine, obviously, there's the main opening between the rectum and, um, and the skin, the anus, but an abnormal connection between two epithelial surfaces. Epithelial surface one being the rectum and epithelial surface two being basically the bum cheek, the skin elsewhere. Um, and there's different types. So you can have extracenteric, suprasenteric, transventeric, inter and submucosal. Submucosal is basically doesn't go through or has nothing to do with the muscles. Intersphincteric comes out of the rectum, goes through the internal sphincter, but then doesn't go through the external sphincter and instead passes between the sphincters, i.e. intersphincteric. And that's the most common type of uh, fistula. Then you have transphincteric, which um, goes through the internal and external sphincter. Quite fairly bad news. Um, then you have suprasphincteric. It goes above both sphincters. And extracenteric, which, um, sorry, extracenteric goes all the way above from the rectum, bypasses everything. Supra goes through the internal and then up and around the external. So there's different types. How does it present? It presents as there's a hole somewhere that isn't the anus that is discharging, usually, it's usually foul smelling fluid. So it's usually sort of pooey liquid um, and it just kind of seeps out. It's obviously distressing because it's, you know, sort of akin to incontinence, you know, smelly and whatever. Um, it's not painful by itself, but you have got an abnormal connection between the rectum and the uh, skin. And you've got bacteria and feces going through that, or at least liquid bits of feces going through that. And so as you can imagine, that can cause an infection. So you have this tube where bits of, you know, diarrhea essentially are going through it eventually it will become infected and then it will form an abscess within that. And we'll go through, there's a picture of that in the next slide. Risk factors, the, the things that you'd expect, uh, things that cause you to have more infections in general, TB, diabetes, HIV, and then Crohn's disease, which is a fistulating disease, unlike ulcerative colitis, which is non-fistulating. Crohn's disease, um, and, and why is that? Is because UC isn't transmural, it only affects the inner layer of the rectum, whereas Crohn's affects the whole layer of the rectum. And therefore there's a chance of fistulas to happen. And that's the main, the main cause. If, if there's someone who presents with a recurrent anal fistula, then they are almost always investigated for Crohn's. Have I mentioned everything I wanted to mention? I think so. So there, we'll go through those little pictures in a second. Um, how do you diagnose it? Surprise, surprise, it's a PR examination. Um, as with all these benign anal rectal pathologies, it's best to have a look uh, and put a finger in it if you can, if they let you. Um, good stools rule is something I will explain um, very briefly now. It is in reference to that bottom diagram. Um, so in that bottom diagram, we have the anus in the center. We've got the anterior, i.e. 12 o'clock position upwards, posterior, um, six o'clock position going down. And we've created an imaginary line across the middle from nine to six o'clock, if that makes sense. And um, Goodsell's rule states that if you're in within three centimeters of the anus, i.e. In, in, in a round, so three centimeters like that, then fistula, external fistula openings go in a straight line to their internal fistula openings. Whereas if it's posterior, they often do a curve towards the midline and then go in. So going back to this, you see these lines, obviously this is a 2D image, but going forward to this one, 
all you can see is the anus and all you can see is the um, e external opening. But somewhere there's an internal opening. And that's important because if you're in surgery, you're using these things up here, which are called Lockhart mammary probes, and you're trying to find without pressing it through and damaging the bowel wall further or the, you know, the soft tissue further. <coughs> You're trying to find the path between the external and the internal, uh, which is which then allows you to do some of the managements, which I'll speak about in a second. So that's why it's important to know this good source rule is because you're trying to guess where it is. So if it's anterior, you can have a safe bet that you go from where the external hole is straight towards the center of the anus, but going backwards. Whereas if it is posterior, then you know that you'll probably have to curl towards the midline and then go up. That's why it's important to know. Again, EUA, examination under anesthesia, because you're, you know, you're putting that probe in a fistula around the bum, not very comfortable. Uh, and MRI is important as well if you have sort of a complex type of fistula and you just basically can't figure out what's going on with the uh, Lockhart memory probes. Imagine you have this extracenteric or suprasenteric, which is going in a snake and all sorts of uh, complex stuff, then an MRI will, because that's the best modality for soft tissue, an MRI will show you what's going on. There's a nice picture of a perineal abscess. So here you had a fistula going this way, this way, this way, going that way. And at some point, somewhere in the fistula, there was a blockage, an infection, and then there's a big abscess, which needs to be drained. So management, if you have an abscess, i.e. a collection of pus, which in this case is walled off by the fistula tract, um, which, which was what makes it an abscess, then you need to an IND, which is an incision and drainage. And in brackets, you let it heal by secondary intention. So you cut into it, you drain the pus, and then you leave it open. So you put packing in, you put gauze, put Aquacel, which is a sort of um, sort of a hemostatic sort of gauze-like ribbon. You pack that in, and then you put a, a pressure dressing on top, and that will then allow it to heal by secondary intention. And that's the only way you can do it, really. Sometimes if they're deep and you can't leave it open because you have a massive gaping wound, you can try and do like a needle aspiration, but I've seen a few of those and they basically always recur often within days until something more definitive is done. But at least it drains the infection. So if they're septic, then that needs to be done before kind of the main thing. Uh, if they're septic, again, sepsis six. So what are some things that you can do once you've found out the fistula tract? You can do fibrin glue, which is the kind of most basic thing, which basically you should forget about immediately because it's glue and it rarely works. So forget about that. Aceton is very commonly used and is the kind of most conservative initial operation. So you might put them under general anesthetic, do an EUA, use your Lockhart memory probe and figure out where this tract is. And now you've got that probe from the external through the fistula and into the internal opening. And you want to now thread a pe aceton, which is essentially literally just <coughs> a piece of thread, thread it through, bring it out and basically tie a knot. So what you've done is you've basically just made a loop from the external into the external, into the external opening, through the tract, out of the internal opening, out of the anus, and you've got a little loop. Sounds ridiculous. I thought it didn't make sense to me for a, a long time when I was being told about it, but it's actually quite clever. So what that does, and you tie it, you don't tie it tight, but you kind of, you, know, you put a little bit of pressure on it. it kind of annoys patients because they have a, a, a knot by their bum, but they get over it. And um, what it does is because of that low, low key tension, it, it leaves the tract open, firstly, because you've got a bit of tension, it leaves the tract open, which means you're less likely to get an abscess, less likely to get a, uh, you know, a collection of infection because it's just freely draining. And because you're kind of pulling on it, what you do is it opens and then it scars behind. And then you're pulling it more and it scars behind. And eventually it goes like that and you end up, the seat on ends up just falling out because it's being pulled slowly and slowly towards the skin and behind it is, is, is leaving uh, layers of scar tissue. That's brilliant because it will fix the fistula because it would have scarred through. And also you haven't had a massive cut through your uh, sphincter. So you have no impact on, um, on continence. That's how cetons work. It, they, they, they kind of slowly over weeks slash months, pull their way through, go more superficial, more superficial, and then leave a scarring tract behind them. And then uh, you haven't damaged the sphincter because it's, you know, it's been used the whole time and um, it scars over. So laying it open, is called a fistulotomy, otomy cut in fistula. 
And that is when you essentially, basically in this image, you would make a cut from the internal through the external and all this bit would just be removed. So you've now kind of got a larger anus, if it were, um, if that helps you visualize it, um, which is obviously useful for the superficial ones. Sometimes maybe the transphenteric, because if you if you have most of the external, that's that's fine. But if you've got an interphenteric or if you get a suprasphenteric, <clears throat> you can't really do a laying open procedure because imagine cutting away all this tissue, you've got no sphincter left and you're going to be, become completely incontinent. So fistulotomy is great if it's superficial, but not good if it's um, you know one of these other ones, suprasenteric, trans, uh, transphenteric. It's also contraindicated in Crohn's because there's too much inflammation and that we've mentioned high tract, i.e. what I just showed, talked about a second ago. Again, advanced flaps, no, it's there, no, it's the last line, but it's all very specialist stuff. Cool, a few consolidating um, questions for us to go through. Um, I'll be looking at the chat. In answer to your question, Emily Wardham, can you watch from the beginning? Uh, yes, it, I think it gets posted to YouTube and we'll also go on the Mind the Bleep web website so you can watch from the beginning and I'll take that as a compliment, thank you. So what is the commonest type of fistula in ANO? We have said this outright, so I hope you will remember. I'll give you a few seconds to kind of work out what each of them are, try and imagine each one. So transventeric going through both the sphincters, supralevator going way above all of them through the levator muscles, complex supralevator, complex version of what we just said, intersphincteric in between the sphincters, so it goes through the internal and then comes out, and then suprasphincteric through the sphincter, but at the top. Most common, intersphincteric. Least common, suprasphincteric. Next question, a 33-year-old lady is admitted with a recurrent discharging fistula in anal. She's known to have anal rectal Crohn's, i.e. Crohn's of that area. On examination, she's found to have a low anal fistula with involvement of a very small amount of the external anal fistula. Sorry, external anal sphincter. What's the most appropriate course of action? Cool, I hope you've thought of an answer. So the answer is insertion of <clears throat> a loose seat on. Uh, if you said fistulotomy, I'll give you half marks, but remember it's contraindicated in Crohn's. So laying open the track would have been the right answer here if it weren't for the Crohn's disease, but because this person has Crohn's, you um, have to use a seat on. So last question, I think, maybe two more questions. A uh, four-year-old boy is brought into the clinic. He gives a history of difficult, painful defecation, hint there, with bright red rectal bleeding. What's the most likely diagnosis? This should all jump out at you, so I'll go through it quickly. Fisher. Twen last question. The 28-year-old male presents with painful, bright red rectal bleeding. On examination, he's found to have a posteriorly sighted, which remember 90% of them are, midline, i.e. the six o'clock position, fissure in ano. What's the most appropriate treatment? This is a sort of entry level um, fissure question. So you should all get it right. Topical GTN paste, <clears throat> sublingual GTN paste, right drug, very wrong location. Anal stretch, that would be bad. Um, they used to do that, but it's extremely painful and didn't really help things. Advancement flap um, would be for really complex stuff that hasn't responded to all the um, initial treatments. And tailored division of the external anal sphincter would lead to incontinence and is not the right answer. Great. Sorry, I'm a minute, um, a minute ahead of schedule or a minute behind schedule even. Um, but the take home messages are the spectrum of diverticular disease, the difference between fissure, hemorrhoids, and fistula. Fissure, painful, hemorrhoids, painless, F fistula. Remember that's in the context of information about Crohn's. We've talked about the key utilities of abdominal X-rays, erect chest X-rays, CTAPs and MRIs in this talk. And we've talked about the key management principles and sort of hammered them home in a few cases. Uh, our website has some further learning stuff. Everything in this talk will go into a PDF and uploaded shortly after this. Um, and please, 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 could you do some um, feedback uh, even if you're watching this on YouTube or whatever, the, the, the feedback code should still be live, I think. Um, and you can probably scan that with your phone 
and answer it takes literally two minutes, not even takes one minute. And I think uh, it's been posted in the chat as well. Thanks very much uh, for letting me jammer on for 60 minutes about bum holes. But um, thank you very much for coming and I uh, hope it's been an educational experience. Thanks very much.